All right, welcome everyone to our In Dialogue series, a partnership between the Louisiana Children's Museum and Tulane's Institute of Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health. My name is Megan Miller and I'm a gallery manager at the Louisiana Children's Museum. Throughout all the challenges and changes that happen and been happening each day, um, our team at the museum and at Tulane have been working together to bring you new ways to interact with the topics that are most important to our community. Since the museum's reopening in June, staff and visitors are learning to adjust to new experiences while visiting the museum. This includes wearing face masks, physical distancing, and participating in modified activities and experiences. But today we are discussing strategies to help children address their worries and uncertainties as we learn to adjust to a new normal with COVID-19. Our session facilitators today are Dr. Mient and Dr. Mirzoy. Dr. Mient is a faculty member from Tulane University School of Medicine. He works in various clinical settings, including Children's Hospital of New Orleans and Crescent Care Community Health Center. Dr. Mirzoy is a third year pediatric general psych psychiatry and child psychiatry, excuse me, resident at Tulane University. So this webinar is being recorded and will be shared on the Children's Museum website. At the end of the session, we will open it up to a Q&A, so if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please submit them using the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. I will now turn the presentation over to our facilitators. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Dr. Mirzoy. I am um, actually, today is my second day of my fourth year of residency. <laughs> it's very exciting. Um, but at Tulane, and I'm happy to be here with you guys. Um, Today we're just going to be discussing um, what this new normal in the time of COVID means and what it means for parents and what it means for kids. Um, we'll go through a few kind of general thoughts and tips about um, some of the more specific things like wearing a mask or how to handle hospitalizations and death and everything like that um, with coronavirus. And then we'll talk a little bit more about general um, tips on how to handle just everyday um, situations. And at the end, if you guys have any questions about specific things that weren't um, uh, covered during this presentation, then I, um, we're happy to answer them at that point. You can put them in the Q&A box. Um, so what does this new normal look for um, for you guys, right? So it's the past couple of months have been really different with all the kids at home. They're not able to go to school um, with the social distancing protocols. I'm sure it's been really difficult for um, family to get together from different households and for people to be able to see their friends. Um, it's summertime. Kids are usually used to going to, you know, vacation um, and maybe going to different countries, maybe going to different states even. And with um, the recent restrictions on traveling, that's going to be a pretty um, new normal for them, right? And it may have been that your family had already had plans to go, you know, to someplace in June or July, and those plans had to be canceled. Um, also, there have been a lot of financial difficulties for a lot of our families um, with unemployment um, being a concern, and then also, especially in New Orleans, having a lot of financial strain. Um, and then last. The, um, but very unfortunately commonly is a lot of individuals know people within their families who have been um, sick with the coronavirus and with a lot of the new protocols in the hospital dealing with sickness in general for kids has been difficult and then on top of that some of these really um, social distancing protocols and a lot of these things that are keeping us safe um, are also unfortunately making it a little difficult for kids to process some of these losses and grief. Um, so I want us to take a moment next slide um to think about and you can put in the q a comment box um just take a moment to think about what's the most difficult thing over the past couple of months um for your child to handle with this new normal and then i want you guys to think about in the next slide what is the most difficult thing for you to handle um, with this new normal so the next slide And yeah, feel free to reflect within the Q&A comment or the, um, the, in the chat little thing. I'm still not good with the logo with Zoom, uh, but uh, feel free to, if you have any thoughts, if you want to share, then you're welcome to share. Um, but the idea is I want you to have that chance to reflect on how the needs and like uh, the things that are difficult for children, um, even 
different ages of children within these past several months, the, those needs and those difficulties are going to be different for children compared to for their parents and other caregivers. And so um, it's just important to reflect on that and to think about that. Um, next slide. One of the most difficult things for both parents and for children alike, but especially for children, has been this new normal of wearing masks. Um, so per AAP recommendations, um, it's recommended that children over the age of two should wear a mask in public when it's really difficult for them to stay six feet away from other people if they're indoors. Um, it's recommended that they wear a mask. If kids are younger than two, um, it's actually safer for them not to wear a mask, um, especially for infants. You never want to use masks and any covering of their face for those um, younger ages. But um, for the older kids over two, it's um, recommended just for protection for your family and then protection from a general public standpoint. One of the best things you can do is actually model that behavior, right? So when they see that their parents and like their siblings and um, their family friends, whatever it may be, are using masks, it's something that makes it a little bit less scary. Um, next slide. And talking to kids about masks can be a little tricky, and especially for the younger ages, um, it can be something that you can make more fun. So when you're having a conversation with little, uh, little ones, what you can do is start off by telling them that wearing a mask is part of being a helpful citizen, just like you learn all of these other skills when you're at school or at home that help you be a helpful community member and a helpful citizen, wearing a mask is part of being that type of a helpful citizen. Um, you can explain to them that when you wear a mask, when you cover your face, you're protecting other people from your unique germs. And then when they wear a mask, they're protecting you from their unique germs. Everybody has germs, and it's just the matter of protecting one another from um, one another's germs. Uh, if they're older, you're able to kind of go into more depth about what germs we're talking about. So you can talk a little bit more about like viruses and coronavirus and the Children's Museum website actually has previous resources that and um, previous talks that we've had um, regarding like how to best talk to your kids about the coronavirus in an age appropriate manner. So you're um, more than welcome to go and reflect and like kind of read all of that information out. Um, and then one of the things that you can do to make it a little bit more fun and um, engage kids a little bit more is just to tell them about the, all of the different other helpers who wear masks uh, within our society. The firefighters wear masks, doctors and nurses wear masks, fire pilots um, wear masks, and you know one of the exciting ones is like superheroes, they wear masks. So connecting them and helping them relate to you know their favorite superhero, um, finding pictures of their favorite superheroes and you know you can even draw like prints one off and draw a favorite like you know a mask um, over like the mouth of their favorite superhero those are really good ways of just kind of reminding them you know when you are a mask you're like all of these other people that are so important in society and you are actually acting like this really helpful other citizen with the superhero that you really you know love and watch cartoons with um, about and such so um next slide I can jump in real quick too. Um, we have started summer camp at the museum and that was one of our worries is having the kids wear masks all day long, but they have been great with it. We have campers from ages four to eight and we've done, you know, a lot of these things talking about how it's important. It's our number one rule of safety. You know, we're going to use walking feet and we're going to be safe. We're going to wear our masks and we're going to be safe. And then just by the staff members wearing it, by the counselors, by the other kids wearing the masks, all the campers have been great about wearing them every day. That's really beautiful to hear. And kids, they do a really good job, especially when you're modeling it and you're explaining it to them. And to like terms that they're able to connect and relate to when you make it fun, they are more than um, happy to um, wear masks. And it's okay if initially they're a little scared. Um, it's new, it's different, and it can be scary. If the, the only other time in the past they've seen masks and is like in a hospital, for example, or something like that, that can be a scary thing for them. Um, so some recommendations and suggestions that can be helpful in helping them to maybe alleviate some of those fears is to actually have them look in a mirror when they're wearing their mask. So whatever their special mask going out mask is, having them put that on and talk about it, you know, or maybe you just have you put it on and you both look in the mirror and then have them work towards putting it on and looking at themselves in the mirror. That can be helpful. And let them ask questions and let them tell you how they feel about it. Um, with uh, their favorite stuffed animal or their favorite superhero, once again, it can be really helpful to give them their own little mini 
mask so that not only is it that your child has a mask, but maybe their superhero, their stuffed animal also has a mask. That can be really helpful. Um, we're in New Orleans, we have glitter everywhere. Put glitter on the masks, you know, um, bedazzle them, whatever it is that your child likes to do and whatever it is that's gonna make it fun and like very personalized for them that's great and the more you connect like have them connected and like um actually hands-on working on your, their mask the more um excited they're going to be to put it on right because they made that that's their thing um and then also it can be really helpful for them to see other if they're not outside a lot showing them other pictures of kids wearing masks or showing them other instances like when you're out be like look that other child who's your age is wearing a mask too look how wonderful it is that a lot of these people are wearing masks we're being really good community members right now um, that can be really helpful because then they notice that they're not the only ones and they're not alone. Um, and then I kind of mentioned this earlier, but like one of the things you can do is like, you can do like a, take a book character or like a superhero and then just draw like a little mask on them. Um, and then practice wearing them at home so that they get used to it before they go out. Next slide. Uh, we talked about modeling already. That's such an important part, right? They look up to you. Your children look up to you. Um, they look up to all of their caregivers, right? Um, and then once again, like routines are really like a very um, common theme. When you're talking about kids, they love routines. And so chances are that when you have a kid, uh, when you have one of your children, they're going out to, you know, to the grocery store, the supermarket, whatever it may be, they probably already have a routine that they're, they follow. You know, you put your shoes on, you put your jacket on, whatever it is. Have this be where all of the rest of that routine information like routine equipment is right put their mask there and so make that part of their routine so it's something that they, they remember they get used to and of course one of the most important things you can do with kids and all human beings in general um, is give them positive reinforcement when they put the mask on um, and when they keep it on so saying good job is one thing and it's always great to hear good job but when you're specific it helps their brain connect that action to that good feeling that they have so when you're telling them good job wearing your mask then what's happening is they're going to remember oh i felt really good because i wore a mask mom or dad or grandma or aunt or whatever it is like said something really nice to me and they like showed me attention and they make it very like specific about what you're proud of them you're being such a good help for for wearing your mask right now or I'm so proud of you for keeping your mask on if they have a tendency of taking it off. So um, it can be really helpful for you guys to just, for you to focus on when they are wearing their mask, right? And being very um, enthusiastic and sometimes really overly excited um, <laughs> at times can be really helpful when they are wearing their mask so that they remember that feeling, they remember what that's connected to. Um, next slide, please. All right, and I'll let Dr. Mant take over from here. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Merzoy. Um, you know, Miss Hannah here on the Q&A was sort of like mentioning and um, sounds like you've been a great role model um, for actually reframing the mask wearing, um, saying um, things that, you know, is a small inconvenience that um, so that we can protect the people around us when the other grown ups are actually talking um, weighing the mask being in negative things and like helping the grown-ups to actually talk about the grown-up conversations not around children is really important and uh, it is hard um, there are a lot of new normal that are happening and um, you know work is home family is home and trying to coordinate those is really um, harder um, you know to do um, and but we do recommend, if it's all possible, trying to actually schedule them so that you can be present um, for whatever you're doing rather than trying to multitask. And there are a lot of studies that show that even though we all like to think that we can multitask really well, it's actually being ineffective in all the tasks that we're doing when we actually do that. Um, and with a current um, virus spreads and you know all of us are actually watching really carefully uh from the public health standpoint where is uh, this going to continue to go um though that the i know a lot of families um and their caregivers parents are excited that the summer camps are reopening we are really thrilled that children's museum has reopened and actually doing things very safely uh american academy of pediatric aap that dr merzoy uh, mentioned uh, had laid out specific guidelines to how to open school um, very safely 
because physically being in school has a lot of positive um, benefit for our children as well. Um, one of the things that uh, we want to actually talk about is, you know, how do we actually talk to our kiddos um, when um, things are happening, when the family member is sick? Um, we know that it's affecting large member of our community, uh, particularly uh, our community members of color. And so I think it's really important how um, we need to be talking to our kiddos. Um, I think it's important to be truthful, um, but really pay attention to their developmental stages. Um, so that the, when um, the loved one's family member is six, particularly in the preschool age, really keeping it simple, sticking with the facts, but try to actually provide a reassurance that the illness is not their fault and there are a lot of grown-ups um, are actually doing everything in their power to actually make sure that their loved ones are okay. So we can say things like, grandma is sick, she's in the hospital, where the doctor and nurses will help her get better. We can't see her right now because she does not feel good, um, will be a very simple age appropriate for the preschool age. Um, as they get older, um, you can sort of expand on that, uh, provide a little more detail and context. Um, so for the school age, um, you can say grandma is sick um, with the illness because of the coronavirus. Um, she's in the hospital. She needs the help of the doctor and nurses and hospital is trying to keep everybody safe from the germs so we can't visit her right now. And as your child, um, you know, grow older and just following their cue, and um, when they do have questions, because um, they are connected to the world and they do hear grown up talk about the grown up things, even we try really hard not to. Um, and so they may ask specific questions and try to answer them truthfully um, and age appropriately. Um, the blanket reassurance uh, without specific context um, sometimes it's not helpful because they can also sense that the grown-ups, when they're talking about it, are worried and anxious. So um, if they ask and uh, you try to be helpful or reassuring by saying, oh, you don't have to worry about that, um, doesn't actually help them uh, reassure as much as we would like them to. So sort of like following along with that, um, the um, if they do actually are seriously ill and um, the loved ones in the hospital lies um, that explain to them that how we keep each other safe um, and how we um, stay away from other sick people so that we are not spreading it again being honest is really important but simple terms um, they're still sick and they need a lot of help from the nurses and doctor um, would be the beginning stages. If and when they're feeling better, you can update them that they are sick but getting a little bit better every day. Um, and when they're ready to actually get discharged, they're almost better, might even be able to come home soon, but they may still need to be quarantined or separated. So you can explain to them that, you know, grandma is actually in her home, but we can't visit her quite yet um, because um, she needs to actually um, get stronger by herself and we um, shouldn't actually expose to um, other lot of people. It's also important to reassure that they're not alone. I think that is a one of the things that a lot of our kiddos uh, get anxious about. Um, it's a separation anxiety or just being alone. So helping them understand that there are a whole team, the doctors and nurses who are taking care of them and watching them closely will help them reassure that. And, and really, if it's all possible, um, keep the line of communications going. Um, and the, those of us uh, are uh, working in the hospital um, have worked really hard. And uh, we had a lot of volunteers um, to actually say, for example, have an iPad so that um, when their loved one who is in the hospital who can't have a visitor but able to talk, um, and they will be able to actually like see the family member and the loved one and communicate. Um, even if um, they're not in a position to be able to communicate for a long time or at all because they may be intubated, just actually making cards, um, sending pictures, or actually um, sing songs and send it. Um, and if um, you do prayer, doing prayer together, 
any little things that actually um, doing something for the loved one who is sick can be really helpful because they do have a task at hand and it can be reassuring. In an unfortunate event that our loved ones passed away and die in the hospital, um, really try to avoid using euphemisms um, because the younger children's, um, their brains are still fairly concrete. And so they do need to actually know um, in a very simple, specific terms that the, um, we can explain um, to them that the people are with them in the hospital and they weren't alone um, when they were being, um, you know, dying or passed away. And figuring out with the hospital team um, how the child can actually be involved um, in a, a dying process um, and the funeral. So the, uh, is it okay to send the message? How can we actually say uh, goodbye remotely if we can tell that um, the death is becoming near? That um, again, reflecting on the positive memories that they have uh, about their loved one with their loved one. So reassuring that their loved ones know how special they are and that uh, how much they love each other. I think those are important. As I alluded to earlier, exploring the, how they can have a funeral memorial uh, with the people that um, they live now or later when it is safe. So just trying to involve them as developmentally as um, romantically appropriate as possible could be really helpful um, to make this really difficult experience uh, meaningful and not necessarily develop into um, specific um, you know, mental health symptoms down the road. The um, help child find an object or picture that connects them to their loved one and remind them of positive times is a really helpful thing to cope. And, um, if you're of a family of spiritual religious practices, uh, guide them in um, doing things together like prayer that they connect to could be really helpful. The um, NCTSN um, has a great resources. Um, and so the link is at the bottom and we'll actually talk about that um, afterwards as well. I'm seeing that the um, other questions And I'll turn it back to Dr. Merzoy. Great, so just a little bit about um, some general adjustment strategies, both for your child, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about some general adjustment strategies for you as a caregiver um, during this time. So it seems like this is gonna be our new normal, once again, kind of connecting back to the theme um, of this entire talk. And so when we're thinking about that, how can we keep ourselves and our children in some level of orderliness. And I'm sorry if you hear a cat, it's my cat in the background, I'm so sorry. Um, but essentially when we're talking about kids first, um, one of the best things and most important things that you can do for children of any age is just to keep a routine in place. Um, kids thrive on routines and it doesn't have to be a super specific uh, routine where it's like every minute is counted for. More so, you can keep it flexible in certain times, but keep their waking up schedule and their meal times and their bedtime um, about the same throughout the week and throughout the months that you guys are in quarantine. It's going to make things a little bit more predictable for them. Um, also, having some general sense or a general idea of what activities they would do in what areas of the, like early in the afternoon or later in the evening, giving them that. Um, kind of general plan can be really helpful for them. And then when they're switching from like one activity to another, really thinking ahead and planning ahead about, okay, well, how am I going to tell them about these transitions? Kids are really, it gets really tricky with kids um, and transitioning from one activity to another. And sometimes um, what can be helpful is giving them like a 
not just like a verbal alarm, but like having like an actual alarm, right? Or, you know, giving them five or 10 minute warnings or something like that, um, depending on their age, right? And letting them know, okay, so this is the plan. We're gonna play this game or we're, you're gonna do this activity for 30 minutes or, you know, one hour and then give them those warnings um, five or 10 minutes ahead of time, depending on the age of your child. 10 minutes may be way too long for a younger kid. Um, they may forget by then. But it's helpful to do a little bit sooner. Um, and then of course, um, it's really important to check in with them regularly. Um, and kids, younger kids, they're still learning that the, the, the skill, right, of knowing what emotions they're feeling. And a lot of the emotions that they end up feeling are extremely intense for them. Um, so it can be helpful for you to put a name to the emotion that they may be experiencing or feeling in that moment. And one of the best things you can do is for younger kids, having like a feelings chart where maybe you have like smiley face, sad face, scared face, um, you know, maybe picking five or six emotions and expanding them as they get a better grasp on those four, first five or six emotions can be helpful. And there's some really great resources online. Um, if you uh, just do, do like a quick Google search for some feelings charts, you can print one off and just put it close to where breakfast is or, you know, where their, their like play area is. And that's a good way of just checking in with them regularly and seeing how they're feeling. And if they're telling you that they're sad or they're upset or they're angry, empathizing with them. Um, there may be a lot of disappointment right now because they were looking forward to something that they're not able to do because of the coronavirus, right? Birthdays are passing and maybe they were supposed to have a birthday party and they can't really have a big birthday party. That's really devastating. And that's like something that's very hurtful for little kids, um, even for little kids. Um, and as they get older, it could be even like bigger things, right? Um, and, regardless of the age, helping them by empathizing with them. And you may not be able to change that situation. You may not be able to change the circumstances, but just letting them know that you understand that they feel angry, or I understand that you're mad. Um, I would be mad too, but we still can't do this, and we still aren't able to do this. But I, I get it. it. It is upsetting. Um, helping them with that kind of empathy is, uh, can go a long way. And then um, also like just keeping them keeping things fresh for them. Um, they will go stir crazy if they're doing the same activities over and over again. And so um, finding new things for them to do and like new experiences to do while at the same time maintaining that social distancing and keeping them safe and their fam your family safe uh, can be really helpful. And um, some of the resources we have listed in the on the ends of the um, presentation, um, if you go to those resources, they, can, they actually have a lot of really good activities. And some of the previous um, presentations that we did with the, um, the series, um, we, we've had like other resources of activities and um, different things that you can do uh, with your kids. So kind of think back to the good old like days of like summer camps and not having TVs all the time and kind of try to bring some of those games back or bring some of those activities back um, as much as you can. And then at all times, just setting clear expectations for what you want your child to be doing and what how you expect your child to be um, like behaving um, can be really helpful. And then providing them with that really specific positive reinforcement can be um, really, really helpful in terms of helping to augment some of this behavioral, the behavioral concerns that people may see um, with prolonged um, quarantining. Um, and like I said, with the specific positive reinforcement, the, the more specific you are and the more enthusiastic you are during the time that the kid is, your child is like doing something, um, the, the more powerful it is. And it's, it's something that I keep on harping on because it's really powerful. So um, you may hear me say it a few more times. But next slide, please. So the next thing that I wanted to talk about was um, general adjustment strategies for, for parents, for caregivers. Um, with caregivers, it, it's important to also, you know, try to keep a schedule for your work. And it can be helpful for you to have your schedule for your work um, in the same public place that you have your schedule for your child's um, day. So, and like helping them to understand like when I'm, you know, I'm, I work or, you know, um, you're going to be busy from this time to this time while they're doing this activity. Um, that can be really helpful and setting that expectation and making that consistent can be really, really helpful if you're able to do so. And I understand that a lot of families may not be able to do it. So you try your best with um, the situation in which you're in. 
With regards to um, some visual ways that some people have found um, helpful for having their kid understand I'm working right now, um, using like a red light, green light. Those are something that's something that's very universal for kids. So letting people like, you know, having literally a red stop sign and like a green stop light or something like that um, outside of where you're usually working checking in with your child before you go into your little zone and letting them know unless you know like this there's like an emergency of some sort um you know i'm working and so you have to be quietly playing or completing this task and you have that red light on and then if it's green then they can come into your space and i think that can be really helpful especially with like, you know zoom meetings and appointments and uh, things like that um, I really wish this worked for cats because my cat is currently like <laughs> going crazy outside the door. <laughs> but it does work for children, um, if not for cats. So, um, and then using that frequent positive reinforcement and giving your children rewards when they do follow those instructions can be really helpful. Um, oftentimes parents and caregivers are so overwhelmed with everything else that they have to do that they forget to like really just check in with themselves and be aware of what they're feeling and what can end up happening is that you there's a build-up there's a build-up there's a build-up and then um uh, something will happen and then you kind of have like a quick burst right um and i think one of the things that we can do is also just being aware of how how we're feeling and how uh, parents and caregivers themselves are experiencing things like anxiety right when parents are anxious or when caregivers are anxious that can actually rub off on children too um, or when there's anger or, or like feeling like unsettled like the kids can pick up on those types of experiences and feelings as well and so just being aware and knowing like okay i need to take a break and, Sometimes huge long breaks are not realistic and that's not something that everyone can do. And um, you do what you can with the, 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 the situation that you're in, right? So if that's a five minute break just to take a shower, make that shower the best shower that you've ever had, right? Like put some music on, do, you know, whatever it is that's gonna give you some space. Um, and take time to um, just kind of unwind yourself. Uh, ask for help if you um, have, you know, family or um, neighbors around you who would be able to help you. Help, ask for help, and um, you know, especially during times of pandemic, a lot of people are really opening up their hearts and their, you know, their phone lines, right? Like for their community to connect and to talk to them about whatever it may be that's really overwhelming, um, you know, them. So. Uh, Asking for help is, is really important. Um, and then, of course, just remembering to reset expectations that you have for yourself and for your children. Um, pandemics don't happen all the time, and it's okay for us to take it easy on ourselves, and it's okay for families to just, you know, stop and reset what our expectations are for um, ourselves and for our children in those moments. Kind of going in line with that idea of anxiety, avoiding catastrophic thinking can be um, really helpful and like at least noticing when you're doing that. Uh, when I say catastrophic thinking, I'm, what I mean or refer to is when um, a small, like maybe like for example, a cough, right? Your child coughs or you cough or your partner coughs and then you're like coronavirus, like that individual has COVID, right? That's like how your brain jumps, right? Uh, that can cause a lot of um, un, like, a lot of anxiety, right? And that's not um, something that we notice we do, but if you just, if you take a moment and if you catch yourself doing this catastrophic thinking, really take a moment to reset and think of alternative things that could be happening, you know, allergy season. Um, maybe they swallowed their spit wrong. I'm not really sure that happens to people. So <laughs> um, there are lots of different things that can happen, right? Um, and then of course, another thing is like, we're, we're constantly inundated with like media exposure, right? There's news articles, there's a lot of TV segments on, you know, the world is ending, that type of thing. And whereas it's really important, it is important to stay connected, um, to know what's going on, right? Um, it's okay for you to just back away from having over exposure to these media um, outlets. So maybe limiting yourself to a, like two articles a day or maybe limiting yourself to just the evening news, um, something like that, so that you can keep your sanity. That's okay, it's not selfish and it's it's reasonable. Um, and then lastly, um, just take it easy on yourself. Don't sweat all of these other things. Like think about maybe one or two developmental milestones that you're focusing on. Um, you know, think about like, you know, keeping yourself and your children alive and healthy and well. Um, and once all of this blows over, we can 
you know, think about ways that you can kind of get all of those other uh, goals that you have for your child or for yourself um, in place. But for right now, it's just taking it easy and, you know, being okay with just keeping yourself healthy and sane is, is, is more than enough of an expectation. Um, next slide, please. And uh, once again, like just in general, talking about anxiety. So uncertainty, it actually brings a lot of anxiety for everyone. And so how you manage um, anxiety in general is not to make whatever it is that you're afraid of, like that fear go away. Um, it's to learn to how to manage that fear and to be able to tolerate that uncertainty of not knowing what's happening in the future, what's happening in the situation. Um, I found that in one of the um, articles I was reading in preparation, I just, I thought that that was something that really spoke to me. I think it's something that helpful to remember in the back of my mind, that you can't get that fear to be completely gone, but just trying to figure out how we can manage that fear is the key. Next slide, please. Um, so with that um, being said, just one of the things that we can model and we can get better at um, and also help our children with is coping with uncertainty. Um, it's uncomfortable, right? If you just take a second to think about how that makes you feel, not knowing when the pandemic, when social distancing will be over, when we'll be able to travel more, that, that when you can go back to school, right? These things are very uncomfortable. Not knowing is very uncomfortable. Um, and so it can be helpful for us to, instead of thinking about that future that we don't know the answer to, focusing on the present and being mindful of what we do know right now and what's solid right now, that can be really, really helpful. Um, and with, like, we talked a lot about structure already. So um, one of the other side effects or benefits of structure is that it actually gives you and your child some stability and some certainty. And so as you can imagine, in times when every lot of things are uncertain, knowing that tomorrow I'm gonna wake up at this time, I'm gonna eat breakfast, I'm gonna do these things, knowing that that will continue to happen is something that's actually really reassuring to children and to adults to be quite truthful um and just remind yourself and your child that you know although it feels like everything's at a standstill life is still moving forward and we are still like going just taking it one day at a time you are moving forward and this isn't going to last forever there will eventually be an end um and then like reassurance can be really helpful um, and your child may need a little bit more frequent reassurance than usual um, but it's important also to be uh, mindful to not to reassure them so much so that they start to need constant feedback because then having that constant reassurance not exist may actually worsen the anxiety so when they're not getting constant reassurance they get really anxious so it's like you need to find that a good balance where you're you are you will need to reassure them but um if it becomes like really like every five minutes they're needing some reassurance right um in the what you can do is instead just helping them to stay mindful and focus on what they're doing right now like just kind of trying to keep them connected to what they're doing right now can be really helpful instead of providing them that constant reassurance um and then next slide please I think that, uh, yes, and then modeling calm um, yourself. So, uh, I mean, we have a lot of worries and adults have a lot of worries and it's important kind of uh, what Dr. Mamp had been mentioning earlier for us to remember that adult worries are adult worries and they're not, like children are not responsible for our worries. Um, that's why there's, that's one of the key things um, if we can, it's like finding a confidant, someone outside of your children to talk to about these worries and making sure being very mindful and being very aware of where are my children right now when I'm talking about these really sensitive things um, because kids can be a little sneaky and they can be listening even when they look like they're distracted and they're wearing headphones and they're watching a movie or whatever it may be they may still be listening and so just being very aware and mindful of that um, because that anxiety can actually add on to them even when we're not even noticing it um, and then like looking for the silver linings, although this is really a really difficult, very trying time, there are some positive things that we can look for, um, look for or look um, at within um, our daily life. So maybe your family just got a new pet. That's a silver lining. And it's something that maybe you can think about and you can remind your children. Um, maybe your, the, your children are spending more time together, right? Maybe they're playing and there's, they're interacting a little bit more um that's something that's great maybe you're taking more family bike rides together 
that's something that's really good. So thinking about those silver linings, um, kids grow up so fast, maybe having these moments a few several you know months with them, even though it might be constant always together. <laughs> maybe it's something that you know you can think about with like them, like I see these milestones, I see them growing up. Um, trying to find those silver linings can be really helpful in difficult times. Um, and then last but not least, it's just there's so much uncertainty. It's okay for us not to know. And kids ask so many questions. It's okay for you to tell them, I, I don't know the answer. When I find out the answer, I'm, I'm happy to tell you. Um, but it's okay for us to let them know that we don't know the answer. And that it's okay for adults to not know the answer, right? Um, I think that is something that's really difficult for kids to understand. It's also something very difficult for adults to cope with. Um, so, with that being said, there are some resources that I would recommend um, anybody who has any additional questions to go to. Um, the Child Mind Institute is a really great resource. They have a lot of coronavirus um, articles and um, like little mini videos. Healthy Children is a website that's run by the American Academy of Pediatrics, the AAP. It's a really great resource. Um, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network has um, some really good, like, uh, little mini books that can help with uh, some of the grief and um, the dealing with death um, part that we had discussed. Um, and then, of course, there are a few other articles that I connected um, and that we linked um, to this presentation that you're welcome, but I would encourage you to look through um, for additional support. Um, what other questions can we answer for you and what other situations would you like to discuss? Oh yeah, and there's a survey, sorry. <laughs> we'll come back to the survey as well. Um, this is a sort of like end of a formal talk um, and the, if, you know, I'll turn it over to Megan. Sure, thanks. Thank you for sharing all those great tips. Um, if anyone has any specific questions or other things you would like to be discussed, please put them in the Q&A now and we can definitely talk about them. Um, do either of you have any suggestions on ways to prepare children specifically for going back to school, whether schools decide to be in person, whether schools decide to do online learning and in person? Um, are there any additional tips you can recommend that parents can start preparing their children now for that back to school time? <laughs> yeah, I think that the, um, as we know more, I think sharing with them and that the, I think we can be truthful about the certain level of uncertainty and they, again, for the younger folks or um, again, you know your children's really the best, if you feel like that the, um, the uncertainty is actually gonna make them more uncomfortable, then we can withhold it until we know more for sure. Um, but I think keeping them updated about how you're checking in with the school and um, you know, as we know more, we will tell you more, I think is a simple way to begin um, sort of preparing for it. Mm -hmm. As we get closer and when you know, for example, summer camps, I believe uh, some of them are starting Monday. And there, if there's gonna be a structure and during the time that we're all staying at home, the routine has gotten a little relaxed, which is totally okay. So like bedtimes and wake up times, we may want to actually start um, moving back towards um, the expected structure times. So because, you know, if, um, we're actually um, allowing them to sleep in until 11 a.m. because things are actually, you know, um, flexible now. But now we're expecting them to actually show up to the summer camp at 9 a.m. or even earlier. It would be a, a pretty big adjustment. So slowly sort of um, preparing for that and structuring the time that would be um, sort of approximate to the expectations um, either school or the camp will be really helpful. So, you know, just like you would have done um, all the other times back to school preparations, you can totally do that with these new normal caveat of we're going to be wearing masks, 
the uh, recess is going to look different. The lunch hour is going to look different. And that, um, you know, the staying in your seat is going to be more important than ever. So teaching those um, and modeling those, I think, could be really helpful. Great. Um, last chance, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to type them in now. Um, there is a survey that we ask everyone to do just to give us feedback on this presentation as well as other topics that you would like to hear about in future presentations. Um, I have put the link to it in the chat box. You should be able to copy it into your browser. Um, I will also link all of our past um, sessions so you can view this session it was recorded as well as other in dialogue sessions that we've had over the past couple months while the museum has been closed and now that we're reopened we're going to continue to do them um, and like we said we'd love your feedback on other topics that you would like to hear about it looks like the, we do yeah um, we have uh, another questions about the um, parents um, with the kids, um, you know, helping children with autism during this pandemic. I think it's a really good question uh, and that um, there are resources out there. The Autism Speaks um, will have um, some of the resources as well as on the um, Healthy Children's. Um, again, understanding, um, because as we know, the autism spectrum is a Y spectrum. And so depending on the child's uh, capacity to understand how concretely or abstractly you will actually lean into um, where they're able to understand. Um, so just, just like everything else, if the child um, actually are a little more on, towards the, the spectrum of pretty concrete, you will actually speak them in the concrete and then utilizing all the skills um, that the child has learned and you have learned to help the child in that concrete manner to implement all these specific recommendations that is set by the public health officials. If they have, um, are able to understand a little more abstract, you will actually get a little abstract. But for them, I think because change is specifically um, especially difficult, may need a more time to adjust to these. So uh, setting a smaller goal rather than um, being frustrated by all parties involved of not being able to achieve the fully effective recommended stages. So may need to actually do a multiple repetitive planning um, and problem solving. And, oh, sorry. Um, and then just to add, I actually found uh, Child Mind Institute, which is the first thing that I sent also um, on that research sheet, has like really great resource that also links to other things as well. Um, and it highlights a lot of the things that Dr. Mian had just mentioned and also has like some principal things that you can um, uh, print off that talk about things like hand washing, that talk about things like um, what is the coronavirus um, for individuals who are on the autism spectrum. That can be really helpful. Um, I will send the, that's the, the link for that resource. I think I accidentally sent it to just Megan maybe. I don't know. Let me, here, I'll let her share it. But that can be, that's a really helpful resource too. Um, and it's really friendly and like, uh, what's it called? Appealing to the eye. Great. All right. If we don't have any other questions, um, we'll wrap it up. Thank you, everybody, for participating today. And like I said, there is the survey. There's the resources in the chat box, as well as a link to our past sessions. So thank you to our facilitators and everyone for joining us. Thanks so much.